Welcome back to the show, everyone. I've got a few rough updates. The Embracer Group have not killed another studio, but what they have done is laid off nearly 100 staff at Eidos Montreal, and they have cancelled a new Deus Ex game from the teams there, which is a bloody sad state of affairs for one of the most critically acclaimed franchises in gaming. Like, the universe is conspiring against us getting good quality Deus Ex. No, instead, the Embracer Group are doubling down on short-term plans for immediate benefits, something that they actually share with Rocksteady, the launch of Suicide Squad's early access offering, has been rather fraught with issues. Uh, there's a lack of review codes, de novo being added on PC, and then server outages. But all of that bad press is seemingly a gamble to get the game's first impression in front of fans rather than critics. But amidst all this weirdness, there is one studio that doesn't have to ask any kind of rough question because, well, Enshrouded has sold over a million copies in its first seven days. Yeah, the survival genre is doing absolutely fantastically right now between it and between PAL World, which certainly does make you look at Blizzard canceling that unannounced survival game. And at least for me, it makes me think, yeah, there's probably something in that genre that they could have done. They just weren't able to have a clear, realistic path forward. From what I understand, it wasn't going to hit in fiscal year 2026, and it would basically be too far away for Microsoft, so they axed it. Yeah, quite a lot of stuff. Let's jump into it. We're going to kick it off with the Embracer Group and the rough things that they're doing to one of my favorite franchises. By the way, the majority of people who watch our channel don't actually subscribe, even though they watch multiple videos. The data we get in the back end is fascinating. And look, it really actually helps me out if you hit that like and also that subscribe button. It sends the algorithm happy signals. And when the algo gets happy signals, it puts our content in front of more eyeballs, which helps me grow the team, grow the show, make things better. I really appreciate it. So that's the sub button. And as for Embracer, well, per Bloomberg's reporting, they have decided to cancel a Deus Ex game that was two years into development. They've laid off a number of employees and they're pushing Eidos Montreal to work on an original franchise instead. This, of course, comes just after the unannounced Deus Ex game was gearing up to enter into production this year. What that essentially means is if you were going to cancel that game, now is probably the time to do it. Because if you maybe scale your team up to production size, which maybe to a degree they already had, but uh, obviously the more people... Uh, you know, the more people in the team, the more times there will be. We don't want that. So essentially, they've cut this right before the monthly burn rate was probably going to get pretty insane. Now, this all comes after the IP was picked up alongside IDOS Montreal and some other assets from Square Enix in 2022. I believe it was for $300 million. I'm not 100% sure that's just from memory. But yeah, Embracer Group, they've been canceling projects like MAD. They've been laying off employees. They've been closing studios because essentially, they did a lot of aggressive expanding and acquiring, but then a, you know, like a billion dollar funding deal collapsed with Savvy Games Group, and that has led to absolute carnage. That's the massive risk with these acquisitions. If it goes wrong, it is brutal. Eidos Montreal released a statement, and in the statement, they explicitly say, look, this is the comprehensive restructuring of the Embracer Group. They also bring up the global economic context, which is definitely true. But uh, yeah, very notable. They're bringing up this with Embracer. Obviously, Embracer can't hide from it. Um, I suppose they're, they're not saying that, like, hey, the project wasn't going anywhere. It, it was good enough for them to be about to enter full, full production. That will have meant that they thought the plan would work. They thought the game would work, and it was worth producing, worth investing in. And that's just what makes it sad. I mean, like, Total Biscuit got me into uh, Deus Ex way back in the day. I've loved that franchise, and man... Oh, it's sad. The thing that is weird, though, is that they're canceling this project to do original IP instead. And in theory, that's a more risky approach. Generally speaking, IP is a useful thing. And you've got Deus Ex. Now, what else has been really big in gaming? Like the cyberpunk genre. A lot of these are sort of playing together. You've got Cyberpunk 2077. Um sort of trying to be a human like revolution successor in terms of some of its design that game is now finished but after an absolutely fantastic final expansion you would think then that there's an audience that's just been reminded of this genre but i think the reality here is this is an immersive sim that might come out in three years that's a lot of money that's a lot of money and those profits are way in the future that's obviously not what they want to do why would they do an, like an internal ip though i've got to imagine because it's cheaper. Like, it's probably a project that they had that was of a smaller scope. 
so I imagine that's what's going on here. Now, there have been rumors about this game. Apparently, it was not going to involve Adam Jensen, uh, so some other uh, brand of Deus Ex. There were job listings in May 2023 that suggested that at least one upcoming title from the studio would have been co-op, which, to be honest, uh, you know, hopefully that wouldn't be the case for Deus Ex. So who really knows? But remember, remember, Embracer Group still owned the IP. So it doesn't matter to them that they've killed this project. That IP is still a good asset. A little bit like the whole situation with Piranha Bytes, where Piranha Bytes is getting yoked, but guess who still retains the IP to Gothic? Embracer Group does. Ah, don't you love some corporate consolidation? Next then, let's talk about the Suicide Squad game. This has been an interesting one. And funny enough, there's actually one review out already from Xbox Era that gives it an 8.2. Uh, who knows where the other ones will fall? But anyway, right. IGN publicly stated that there would be no pre-release reviews for this game, and they then confirmed that they just weren't getting a key uh, because, um, well, they, they tacitly sort of said, or at least heavily implied that it was following um, previews being negative from them, which of course we talked about a little while ago. So they're just buying an early access code for their reviewer. And uh, you know what? I think IGN will probably be able to foot that bill. Now, this wasn't the full story. Actually, the other side to that is there's no pre-release access for um, anyone, even like streamers and content creators. They're only getting access on the launch of the early access release two days in advance. Um, and then in the way that things usually are, of course, de nouveau. <laughs> <laughs> the Denuvo flag was added to this game's Steam page before launch. This is what, as an example, Warner Brothers did with Mortal Kombat 1, where, um, yeah, sneak it in. In this case, uh, they didn't seem to have, like, big performance pushback for that game. But anyway, that's what happened. But then it was also paired with some good news coming from QAs with the team. So let's just go into that. Number one, the battle passes follow the Halo model. Now, as you know, I'd rather it's not a game with a battle pass. But what I will say is serious props to Halo because the way this works is you can buy them. And when you buy them, you have them forever. You can complete them at any time. So that essentially means it is a FOMO list design. And I think that is uh, far better. The game is also seen seemingly fairly well optimized in size, ranging from 45 gigs and PS5 to 65 gigs and PC. Uh, the UI, by the way, that everybody was memeing on can actually be turned off on a fairly granular level, and the store wasn't even as egregious as it could have been. There's an $11 costume set with two alternative patterns. Certainly other games do take the piss a lot more there. But unfortunately, as the game was going to launch, something very bizarre happened. Problems quickly became apparent. Uh, the game's $100 limited edition that offered offered two days of early access, well, had its early access revoked for multiple hours when the game was launched in New Zealand. So they actually pulled it. Basically, what happened is something in the build was marking early access players as having automatically completed the game's campaign. So for a game like this, you know, boot it up, bam, you finished. Amazing. You can get some gamer score without even having to play. So, I mean, it seems to me like some sort of development tool QA flag was just mistakenly applied in the launch build. But anyway, that sucked. And because of this time spent offline and because the game's offline mode is going to be shipped post-launch, we basically have a situation where they had to pull the entire game uh, to, to be patched which is wild. This state of affairs went on for several hours, effectively reducing the value of the early access purchase with every minute. But at least as of the time of writing, the issues have passed. It has actually went online in the UK and the US. So any outages now will just be the sort of standard thing. Of course, the problem is that's the early access period to your highest paying customers. You want to give them a great experience. They were not able to do that. But what they have done is given people $20 worth of premium currency. Uh, that's for everybody who owns the deluxe edition within the day. So between all that madness and the lack of pre-release reviews, basically we're all finding out what this game is like in real time as it goes online across the world. Overall, this seems to be a game that is playing better with people who actually get it in their hands rather than playing in a preview environment. We saw streamers and some early impressions that are actually above where expectations were. Even just look at this tweet from Jordan Midler. Uh, so far, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is basically DC Comics meets The Division 2 with Sunset over, uh, Overdrive Traversal. Great writing so far, genuinely funny. So maybe it's not going to set the world on fire, but could actually be a DC game experience, at least within uh, whatever the hell this overall game as a service product um, ends up being. We'll just have to see, though. It's a fairly interesting thing. Uh, we talked about this earlier on on the channel with how they've been like doing their previews and managing their PR. They essentially had people uh, breach an NDA and leak impressions, but those impressions were actually better, uh, seemingly better than some of the previews. So then they just like 
said that that NDA no longer applied. Uh, now the way that they've handled these reviews, it very much seems that the plan here in terms of reputation management is to bypass reviewers as much as they can. Number one, damage limitation. But number two, maybe they think that players will enjoy it more than reviewers. And there is an argument to be made for that. How many times, say, on a, on a Rotten Tomatoes do you see something like that? Or a game be maybe a six and a half out of ten, but actually an 85 in Steam because it's just games being played in different environments. It'll be interesting to see, but I do have some more undisputedly good news, actually, and that is what's going on with Enshrouded. Of course, everybody's looking at Pal World. We are doing a, like a second deep dive into that. The news cycle just been so crazy. We haven't got to that because there's so much interesting stuff in the success of that game, which no doubt will be one of the most uh, like successful games of this year. And to be honest, in terms of like cost of development to revenue, like, is this going to be one of the most profitable games? I don't know. Maybe there's some gacha game out there doing way more. Anyway, anyway, Enshrouded was a very clear winner of the last Steam Next Fest that gave people basically an, an eight-hour window into the game. It had a positive response. It was one of the most downloaded demos. It's now out in early access, and they're not Pal World numbers. But the thing is, Pal World numbers, those are all people playing Pal World, and the genre overlap here is absolutely massive. So maybe when people are done with Pal World for a bit, I have got to imagine a lot of those will rotate over to Enshrouded. It's got a million copies in only four days, which, uh, I mean, that is that is an amazing, that's amazing sales, uh, sitting here at like 84%, um, which, hey, for a, like a new early access survival game, like 84 is actually pretty damn good. As a game, it is very much the quintessential, like, this will be successful on Steam style of survival game. Pseudo-medieval fantasy, uh, multiplayer options that, yes, had some teething problems early on, and importantly, a suite of creative building tools other than just liking their key art and paying attention from that, one of the ways that I found out more about this game is just browsing, say, PC Gamer and seeing a compilation of what people have built with this game's tools. And some of the builds are really, really cool. It's interesting too, is rather than having procedural generation, this is a handcrafted world that will be the same for everybody. Filled with NPCs, dungeons, quests, a whole RPG leveling system, you know, character customization, all of that, which just means you're you're getting a lot of the benefits of this genre of game, but also authored craftsmanship. You know, the authored craftsmanship of a good fantasy RPG. You're getting the mechanical complexity of a survival game. This seems like it will be extremely, uh, extremely sticky that people will just play this for a long time. What then grabbed me though is the twist they're putting in and also the reason why the game is called uh, Enshrouded because the land is enshrouded in a poisonous fog. If you spend too long in that fog, you can die. So you end up with a challenge then of just navigating, you know, for your resources and your tools, uh, dealing with, you know, the poison and, um, you know, just, you know, planning your, uh, planning your expedition. I, I suppose it's almost like a little bit of an extraction style um, situation. I just think it's cool. I'm um, going for some critics. Skill Up is incredibly impressed uh, with it, framing it as essentially being theoretically quite close to the perfect survival game, which, you know, once it gets past its early access jank, could be, you know, really a true champion of the genre. And to me, well, the way that it's, uh, well, it's voxel based, right? Now, that's, uh, of course, we're most used to that in Minecraft, where, you know, you're, you're basically like a one meter squared, like that's what a Minecraft block is. Here, they they are not. <laughs> and uh, that actually means, yes, just the granular building. Uh, here's like a big, uh, you know, big house somebody's made. Um, here's a three player hideout inside a mountain. So, you know, all of all of the like little fantasies that you could actually want. I mean, just look at this. I've seen people making, you know, Hobbit homes. Um, I, I don't know, maybe you want to make like Erebor. Uh, I suppose you could do that. Um, I mean, totally, like, young me would just think, I know what I'll do. I'll make Helm's Deep. And, um, yes, that would probably take a, a year of building. Anyway, it's great to see successes in the games industry. A lot of you guys have said, hey, dude, there's a lot of negative stories these days. One of those is just the inherent bias of you're covering newsworthy things. Um, but certainly we're aware of that. It's why I'm really happy that Enshrouded is doing well. It's why I want to actually jump into Pal World again. I want to talk a little bit about like why it's actually successful. Because if it was just a meme game, then it would be a flash in the pan. But it's like, it's player numbers are absolutely, like they are, they are not dropping massively. That is super impressive. And I think a lot of games are going to be learning lessons, uh, you know, lessons from it. So plenty to talk about, but that's today's story. Of course, thank you very much for watching. If you want to subscribe, it would truly actually help us out. And with that said, well, check out that story. It's, uh, yeah, spicy. I think you'll enjoy it.